of SCI Connections. Dr. Mark Nguyen is the Associate Chief of Spinal Cord Injury and General and Orthopedic Rehabilitation in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation over at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Dr. Nguyen graduated from Drexel University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and completed his residency training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Boston University's Medical Center. Before coming to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, he was on the staff at Spalding Hospital in Boston and was, the fact, was one of the faculty in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Harvard School of Medicine. In addition, Dr. Nguyen received his postdoctoral training in acupuncture at the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Dr. Nguyen is part of a multidisciplinary in inpatient team approach to spinal cord and orthopedic injury re rehabilitation that supports exceptional patient outcomes, including functional improvements, and is, are, is related to the highest possible levels of independence and quality of life. Along with his work in treating individuals with spinal cord injury, Dr. Nguyen supervises Stanford Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation um, for residents who also train over at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. And today he's here to talk to us about pain after spinal cord injury. Dr. Nguyen? Hi. Um, so, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to sit here and go through the slides. And I hope it's very informal. Um, if you have questions, please ask. Um, I did have a a video for you guys, but I'm not sure we can get it. But um, it was hopefully to um, show how pain pathways work. So um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I definitely think pain is um, very um, important. It's probably the most common complaint you're going to get in any um, doctor's office. And um, I'll go into the prevalence in spinal cord injury based on um, on studies and everything. And I, I know I recognize a bunch of faces. Um, I know you guys are patients there and everything, and um, it's good to see you all. <laughs> so here are my goals. Hopefully I'll be able to convey a basic understanding of pain physiology, um, and then how it relates to spinal cord injury, and then review some treatment options. Um, I think the first two are more important than the last because treatment options um, vary and there's nothing to support that it even works. <laughs> uh, so I can't give you any studies on it. But um, So let's get to it. So my background is that I, um, I started off in pain management. Um, my background is physical medicine and rehabilitation. But after I graduated, I actually went into pain management, and um, I was able to treat a lot of patients who had chronic pain. And spinal cord injury can, of course, lead to spinal, um, chronic pain because I still see patients um, in the outpatient and they still have pain like 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so it's, it's very, um, um, yeah, it's very important. Um, subject in spinal cord injury. So I, prior to coming here, I actually did a lot of inpatient pain work at um, Spalding Rehab, which is in Boston. And we had probably one of the few inpatient um, pain programs where it's multidisciplinary. Now this was a diff different population, but you know, from that experience, I was able to um, understand more about how pain affects the person. Because I'm going to give you a definition of pain, and it's very um, uh, person-oriented, how a person perceives pain differently. So I was able to see how patients who, at their last straw, would actually come in wanting to be taken off all their pain medications and just try alternative means because um, they've come to understand that medications alone don't work. And that's going to be the crux of my presentation, is that there's no one way to treat pain, uh, because there's no one, one way to perceive pain. So let's, let's, let's go on forward. So this is a definition of pain uh, put out by probably the most re reputable um, institution of, in pain. 
It was from the International Association, Association of the Study of Pain, IASP. It said, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. I highlight emotional experience because pain is very emotional. And because of that emotional component, so many things come into play and affects our lives, your lives, um, so much. It's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. I highlight potential. Everyone knows that actual tissue damage, like a cut or a bruise, broken bones, can cause pain. But I highlight potential because what that means is you don't actually have to have physical, you know, um, source for pain because your body remembers. It's an amazing thing. Um, so let's go on. And um, so what does pain consist of? Well, everyone knows that pain is very subjective. Uh, my pain might be different from Robert's pain, from your pain. So my, let's say if you go on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most severe pain you can imagine, uh, I might be experiencing 10 out of 10 pain, but maybe to Robert it's like 1 out of 10, you know. Um, maybe because I'm going through more, more or I have more of an emotional load or I have less of, of ability to cope with the pain. Um, and I'm going to show you why that's very important. So not only is it very subjective, and so it's hard to treat, and this is actually uh, um, a lecture I give to the residents, and actually we gave uh, in one of the spinal cord injury conferences, and I put this in there to tell um, practitioners that treating pain is very difficult because of the subjectivity. Um, so you really have to get into the, the crux and the, the, the source of the pain. You have to get to know the patient, get to know what their background is, what they're going through, um, whether they have adequate um, coping strategies or not. Not only is it very subjective, it's multifactorial. You know, the slide on the right shows you all the components, and I don't think that's even complete. All the components that can come in to play when someone feels pain. Um, you can tar start from the top. I mean, what's their social background? I mean, are they going through, you know, did you just get fired or um, are they going through a divorce or et cetera? Cultural background? I mean, I know that, you know, depending on some cultures, pain is not really um, as recognized. Um, genetics, of course, it's, you know, Maybe some people are more wired than others to deal with pain versus not. Um, molecular level, cellular level, um, psychosocial. Uh, and that's where the part of, you know, the connection between body and mind. And how good is that connection? How well can we handle the emotional component of pain? So prevalence of pain. I mean, most studies, you know, they quote 70 to 80 percent. Uh, the individuals with SCI have pain, but um, I see a lot of people here with SCI. Can you can, I, can you raise your hand if you had dealt with pain when through SCI? So one, I mean, I would say roughly 100 <laughs> percent. And you know, in in my experience with treating spinal cord injury, I'd say 90 to 100 percent patients have pain. It's across the board. I mean, I had slides here that go into detail uh, and break it down. Um, and I didn't put it up here, but as you can see, um, the second line, like right over here, it's just this study had an N or a sample of 73 patients over a five-year span, and 50-50 pairs and tetras. Uh, 40 to 60 percent complete, incomplete, and that's only the breakdown of the patient itself. Um, like I said, I think 90 to 100 percent of the patients have pain. So essentially, it's everyone has pain. You know, incomplete, complete. Um, physiology. I was going to give you, show you a little uh, video that um, tracks pain all the way from the periphery into the brain, um, but I will describe it to you. <laughs> so pain travels through nerves, of course. Now pain, um, let's say you get a cut. So there are nociceptors. These are pain sensory receptors. 
that give a chemical response when they are altered or they are damaged. Now that chemical response leads to an impulse, an electrical impulse that travel from the periphery into your spinal cord. That's called your primary afferent. A as an apple, afferent. So as it travels from the periphery into your spinal cord, there are two connections before it goes into the brain. It connects to what we call an interneuron, which is a smaller neuron, and it's that, that interneuron where a lot of changes are made. A lot of what we call synapses or connections are made, not only from the periphery, but you get a feedback into the interneuron, and also from the brain, there's a, a descending pathway. And that descending pathway also connects into the interneuron. And from that interneuron uh, in the spinal cord injury, that's when it travels up to the brain. And when it gets up to the brain, it hits different parts in your spinal cord, uh, into your brain stem, and ultimately it goes into your thalamus. Now surrounding the thalamus are things like the amygdala, the hippocampal area, and these, if you know anything about physiology of the brain, these are emotional sensing um, parts of the brain. Uh, I'm sure Penny can attest to that. So imagine you're surrounded by all this brain tissue, brain matter, that control emotions. Right in the middle is the thalamus, and that's where the pain source goes into. And from there, it's, it's interpreted. And from that interpretation, you get signals into your frontal region, which is the you know, interpretation, um, how you interpret the pain itself. So I, my biggest point there is, right next to the pain sensing part of the brain is the emotional part of it. So there has to be some synapse, there has to be some connection. So I broke, it, I broke the afferent sensory nerves to A delta and C fibers. These are the pain sensing um, fibers. Some sense the sharp shooting pain. Um, that's the A delta. The C fibers are um, a little thinner. They travel slower. And they deal with the gnawing, aching, you know, deep pain. Uh, I, I also include A beta. Now, A beta are actually um, mechanical sensors. If I were to just massage your, your arm, it's the A betas that are sensing it and sending signals into your sonic cord up to your brain. Um, these are, the A betas are very important because those help in changing the way you perceive your pain. And you also you have the efferent or the descending pathway. These are pathways from the brain that goes down into the interneuron and changes the way, it can change the way you perceive the pain. So you have a ascending pathway, pain, and a descending pathway. And you actually have control of that descending pathway. You do. I'll show you how. So I have I had tons of slides in classification and it was more for the physicians and the health workers because pain is some and especially in spinal cord, um, it's not classified well. There is a push to classify it because what does it do? It allows us to communicate to patients and to other practitioners, healthcare providers. It helps in diagnosis, and I'll show you how it helps. And it helps in research too, because if we communicate, then we can discuss research work and um, what have you. Now, classification of the pain are by two types. It's nociceptive and neuropathic. Now, neuropathic, it's best to explain it by explaining neuropathic per, first. Neuropathic is nerve pain. And you can probably tell me about nerve pain, right? It's the burning, tingling, pain the needle, numbness, um, deep aching, pain that has no rhyme or rhythm. It just undulates, comes on without activity. It can wake you up at nighttime. Um, no type of pain is everything else. It's the cuts, it's the deep bruises, uh, it's the abdominal pain. It's all within the nociception, uh, nociceptive pain. The nociceptive pain is broken up into muscle skeletal, meaning muscle bone, ligaments, tendons, or visceral, meaning you have sensory nerves that are innervating your um, gut, um, your inner um, organs, and sometimes when those get injured, it's when you have the visceral type of pain. 
So again, you have nociceptive pain broken up to, no, to musculoskeletal and visceral pain. And I gave examples of these things up there. Um, now, neuropathic pain, again, um, the, here's a definition by IASP. It's pain initiated or caused by primary lesion or dysfunction of the nervous system. Pretty general. So nerve pain, damage to the nerves. And doesn't actually have to have, you know, from the other definition, not really actual nerve damage, but it can be previous nerve damage that now there's modulation in memory. And even though the nerves have healed, you can have memory of that pain. Now, this nerve path, this, this, this pain in general is broken up into location. So essentially, let's say you are a, a thoracic four injury. So right, right here, okay, T4 injury. Um, it's not uncommon to have an at level pain. Um, you sometimes describe it as a you know, a ring of fire, a, a ring, someone like taking a tourniquet around your, this area and just tightening it up. Um, that's where the level of your injury. And the way I describe the patients is just imagine that um, that's where most of the nerve damage is, is going on and your nerves are, tr are just firing like crazy. It's trying to heal. It's trying to find itself back to normality. So a lot of people have that pain there. It's an at-level pain. Below level pain, you can have because remember, most of your sensory, um, pain sensory travels up. And if you have a disruption up here, it's the perception of pain, the way you perceive it can be um, a little off or a little severe. And sometimes you have the burning, tingling, pins and needle pain in the lower, below. So almost 100% of the pain is neuropathic down there, below level. So you have at level and below level. And you're going you're gonna to hear some of the spinal injury patients talk about that, at level, below level, and above level. Above level will include any of the musculoskeletal pain that can happen, like ligamentous or muscle tightness. Um, yeah. So this is more for the practitioners, but I tell the, the doctors, you know, uh, history and physical is so important because you need to get a good story of what's going on. You need to do your detective work. Um, pain sometimes... I, I can tell you that through medical school, you know, pain is, is not really taught that well because, you know, no one wants to deal with it and it's seen as, oh, they have pain, just give them some pain medication, hopefully it goes away. Um, so I tell the, the, the residents or the, the, the people I'm talking to, the healthcare providers, to really do your, your, um, your investigation because if you do your investigation, there's usually a story behind that that can tell you what's going on. And that will help um, you um, gear your, your treatment instead of just, you know, um, blasting them with pain medication or, or medications in general. Um, it's equally important to do an accurate Asia exam because you'll know where that level pain is. Um, and it's good to get a diary of the pain. And I'll show you what a pain diary looks like. So evaluation of pain, you know, I tell the residents that this can be very, very difficult because not only is it subjective, um, but you can have a lot of things, you know, coming into play. We, we talked about all those things, emotional, psychosocial, um, you know, genetics, background. You know, these are different ways that pain is, is evaluated. Um, one to ten visual analog scale or the Wong Baker faces that I have up there. You know, I tell patients, you know, your pain scale is your pain scale. And it's in no mean to lessen your pain or make it more. It tells us where your pain's at and where we need to go. Um, so I tell them, you know, just tell me on the scale of how you feel. Because they, you know, I know some patients feel like, you know, if I don't tell them high enough, I'm not gonna get treatment. You know, but the thing is, if you tell high enough and we treat you too much, you're going to be gronked out. So be very honest with your pain. Um, and I find that patients who are really, um, who really want to deal with their pain and not have secondary gain, like they want to get high or they want to whatever, I tell patients, you know, just be very accurate with your pain, very honest with your pain. Um, and if you're dealing with a practitioner who really is, is committed to helping you with your pain, they, they, they appreciate that. One thing that I'll do is I'll make sure that I'll print out the slides. So I know it's probably hard to see, so I'll make sure that I'll email them to you. 
Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you can get um, the the YouTube videos. It's very pretty neat. But we have the slide. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that we use a lot, uh, because pain is so subjective, is function. You know, we see how you're doing functionally, because that's the telltale sign of how you're handling your pain. Someone can actually have more potential pain, but if they have better coping strategies, they can function better. Whereas those that have less pain and less ability to cope with it, it's going to show in their function. They, they can't transfer. They can't do the exercises. So we, we kind of go upon that. This is a pain diary, and this is a uh, diagram method. So essentially, you have um, see my pointer here, and you don't. So you you have time on the x uh, axis and and pain intensity on the y axis. This helps me to know where your pain's at and how to um, accurately treat your pain without over treating it. And I'll show you how. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. This patient has 8 p.m. Oh, 8 a.m. I'm sorry, it's wrong. 8 a.m. PT, 8 uh, 3 p.m. OT scheduled, and that's when their pain gets really high. Not unusual, right? I mean, you guys see that a lot. So treatment, um, I, I broke it into two categories: non-pharmacological and pharmacological. Now. Non-pharmacological, I mean, this is the part of treatment that most practitioners don't know about. But I tell the residents or those that I'm talking about um, and patients is, you know what? The best pain doctors are the ones uh, that have a lot of tools. Because if they can knock off 5% here, 10% here, um, in the long run, that's going to be better for you. Then someone who's going to give you, who's going to try to knock off 100% with opiates or pain medication. So I put this first because I feel that these, this is even more important for long-term use or long-term treatment. Education I put up at top because, you know, I tell the um, residents, you know what? A lot of times patients have more pain because they don't, they're afraid of the unknown. They don't know what's going on. They're just feeling the pain. If you take time to do your investigation um, to educate the patient, you know, Mr. X, this, this is exactly what's going on. This is why you're having pain. Here's my plan for you. And don't leave them hanging. You know, first two weeks, here's my plan. After two weeks, if things don't work, we're going to uh, reevaluate. If things are working, you know, we can talk about backing off your pain medication because there's problems if you stay on it too long. So if they just take time out to educate the patients um, to go over their treatment plan and have a plan long-term, not just short-term, I think that leaves a lot of fears. I mean, you guys can tell me. I mean, I, I feel patients, once we're, you know, we're explaining what's going on, it, 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 it eases their mind. They know what's going on. They know that, hey, my doctor you know, has a plan for me. And it's not going to leave me hanging here. So... Um, I always think that's the best way. Exercise, of course, is very important. Modalities, um, ice, heat, you know, psychological. Um, I can't paint up here and, and talk to you guys about that. But <laughs> procedures, you know, there's different procedures. But again, it's only a tool. In and of itself, injections are not the way to treat with pain. Not to treat pain. Acupuncture, there's no studies about that. It's hard to do a sham acupuncture study. But, you know, I think overall... You know, it, it can help, you know, um, maybe, you know, because acupuncture, the whole theory is moving chi. That's, you know, the Asian, I think it, what it means is moving humor or blood. Because a lot of pain happens because there's not enough blood flow to that area. So if you, because all acupuncture is, is, you know, what we're taught is opening up gates of chi. So, you know, I think the same way is if you, somehow get blood flow to the area through stretching, exercises, heat, massage. Uh, it's the same thing. But, you know, I, I have patients who um, do feel like acupuncture helps. Penny. I did my dissertation in the hospital using acupuncture. Yeah. So that's like massage. And any area above the injury is more effective than the pain. And it works great. Yeah. 
So, oh, well, well, she actually made a, a statement. So her statement was that, um, Penny's statement was she did a dissertation on acupressure and how acupressure is similar to acupuncture because you try to hit certain um, nodes um, and meridians. And she was able to get some success in relieving some muscle skeletal pain, right? Yeah, that was the. Sorry about that, guys. Education. You know, I, I went to that already. Treatment options, telling them why they have pain. Exercise. I mean, we all know that inactivity can lead to pain. I don't have a spinal cord injury, but I'll tell you, if I'm inactive, I'll have pain. Back pain, leg pain, everything. More so, um, unfortunately, you know, those that have spinal cord injury have uphill battle against um, being inactive. Because if you're inactive, you know what's going to happen. Worsening spasticity, contractures, you know, muscle weakness, uh, tendon weakness, uh, you know, uh, osteoporosis, more prone to bone fractures. So I tell patients, you know, it's so important to stay as active as you can. Um, and plus, inactivity, you know, affects the mind. You know, an inactive mind uh, leads to anxiety and depression. And those are two main weapons um, that you can use against your pain if you keep yourself um, as least from being depressed as possible and least anxious. Um, that's the descending pathway. That's the modulation uh, I'm going to go through. Modalities, you know, massage, you know, compression. Now, you know, I'm so big on compression. You know, when I when I first came here from my pain background, you know, when I saw someone with with, um, with neuropathic pain, especially in extremities. First thing I do, I, I slap on a compression garment. And I don't know if, if you guys experienced some of that or not, but you know what? What that does is, um, you know how when you bang yourself and you, you rub your your, your awi and it helps, you know, because there are other nerves that travel into that interneuron area, and what it does is it shuts down the, the pain. It shuts that transmission of the pain nerves, um, prevents it from even going into your brain. Um, so there's some theories of pain that if you have neuropathic pain, you give a little compression, some normal sensations, some massage. That in itself you know, can travel up and shut down that pain at the interneuron level. Um, desensitization, same thing, compression, and some desensitization include contrast baths, meaning some warms and cools. If you were under my care, I mean, I try all that stuff. Um, and paraffin, which is like wax, um, textures, massage, tens units, ice and heat. But of course, you have to be careful because you're, you know, if you're insensate, you have to be careful about use of the ice and heat packs. Now, gate theory pain, again, I, I just kind of described it. I put down a good um, analogy is fast pass. Have you, you've been to Disneyland? <laughs> you, know how, you know how there's, um, you can use your fast pass, and if you're in the normal line, you're moving, you're moving, and suddenly you're stopped. Because, you know, some, some kids or somebody have, have pa fast passes, and they just go straight and head of the line. So that's the same thing. You know, um, you can actually have fast passes by, you know, doing that little desensitization. And then the normal pain um, sensory stops. Yeah. I just recently went to Disneyland. I was thinking about this. <laughs> and, you know, I was in the, the normal line. I, you know, we were going and we stopped for a long time. This is Space Mountain. And, man, it took, it took so long because everyone uses that fast pass. So it works, you know. Fast pass works, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was. I had a YouTube um, video about how pain uh, is um, has a connection with your, your your mood and your your emotional sensing part of the brain. It's a very intimate intimate uh, connection. Um, you can look at it um, from the slides. This is a. So essentially, I kind of explained to you. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. If you have internet connection on your computer, you can just hit it and it'll, it'll go into your, yeah. Or just paste that address onto the YouTube, and, uh, or, yeah. I'll play the video at the end of this uh, webcast so that we can record it on the actual recording, and then we'll make the link available so you can go back and view it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you'll be able to do the video. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, ping goes right into your thalamus, and ha from there, the, there's projections into your cortex. And not the, 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 the old memory, but new memory is right in your cortex. So there is connections from the thalamus into the cortex. Um, so pain has memory. So that if you suffer um, pain initially from your initial spinal cord injury, um, your pain, I mean your brain modulates, it has memory. So that um, it can replay that pain over and over and over. Even though the physical or the physical damage has been healed over and that's why some patients, you know, still have pain five years out, you know, resembling the pain that they first had when they had their injury, because your pain has memory. Yeah. So, so uh, the question was, are there any tricks to unlearning that memory? Well, you know, the funny thing is, the only way you can unlearn it is um, to I guess the best way to, ex to explain it is to try to stamp it out, stomp it out through uh, acquiring coping strategies. Because um, a lot of that memory is amplified by um, anxiety, you know, depression. And if you deal with those two, um, you know, you change the chemical balance, you change the synapse, the connections, um, so that you unlearn that, that pain. So it's those, you know, um, non-medical ways to deal with pain that's going to undo that memory. Yeah. Yeah. That's an. Yeah. You know what? Some of the toughest pain situations I've ever been in are patients with traumatic brain injuries because the physiology is is already a little you know off already. So, yeah, yeah, but it can be done. You know, all you need to do is go back to the basics. You know, deal with anxiety and depression, um, and all through all the means. You know, activity. You know, mood stabilizers. You know, act, you know, yeah. So I talk about about you know um, psychological ways to deal with your pain. Um, so essentially. Pain is a cycle. As you see up there, if you can see it, um, pain, the gist of it is pain can cause you to be anxious. The anxiety can cause you to be depressed. The depression can make your pain worse. You know, more anxiety, more depression, worse pain, anxiety, depression. It's like a cycle. And to answer your question about how can you break this memory, you break that cycle. Whether you do with anxiety, whether you deal with the depression, uh, you have to make sure that the, the physical part of the pain is dealt with, making sure you're active, making sure that there's no you know, perpetual damage to your spinal cord. Um, so you have to break that cycle. That's, that's how you do it. Sleep, very important. You know, if I don't get enough sleep, you know, I'm horrible the next day, can't do anything. Um, I tell you, you know, the toughest pain patients if I'm overwhelmed by just how much pain they're going through, how emotionally impaired they are, first thing I do is, how's your sleep? You know, how can I help you sleep? Because if you sleep well, at least you have a fighting chance the next day to be active, to deal with anxiety and depression. Um, sleep is very important. More so when, you know, if you have a spinal injury. You know, some procedures, I'm not going to even go into this because it's only a tool that your doctor should suggest to you, not as a long-term plan, but an immediate plan, you know. Now, we're going to get into the medications. Um, there are non-opiate medications, you know, Tylenol, which is acetaminophen. It has pain properties, but it doesn't have anti-inflammatory properties. 
anti-inflammatory NSAIDs, which are anti-inflammatories, do have pain, anti-inflammatory, and anti-fever, you know, um, properties. Then you have the topical analgesics. Um, some people have heard like, you know, lidocaine patches, capsaicin cream, um, NSAID creams, um, like uh, diclofenac creams too. Um, again, I bring this up because, you know, if I can knock off a few percentage points with um, of your pain, uh, and then a few percentage points here and there, you know, I mean, and plus, you know, I tell patients, here's what I tell patients, you know what, my, my goal is not to take your pain away. Because pain has purpose. You know, it's to tell you that, hey, you might be injuring yourself here. Uh, it's to alert you. Um, so I tell them, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, let's say your pain's an 8 out of 10. You know, if I can knock it down to a 5 or 6, you know, I think that's good. You know, I'm not here to take it down to a 0 or 1. Um, because by that time, you're probably non-functional. I probably snowed you with opiates and, you know, it's not a good thing. Um, so I, I preface that, you know, my goal, so they fully understand, is not to take your pain away. It's to make it more manageable by these tools, by certain medications, by certain procedures, by some exercises, a little bit here and there. And you guys have to be open to that. You have to say, you know, yeah, I, 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 I see your game plan and I'm with you, you know. Um, as opposed to those, no, I only want opiates. You know, I only want medications. Yeah, I don't care about, you know, you know, this and that or exercise and, you know, psychological stuff. You know, I tell the, you know, residents and uh, healthcare providers, you know, the opiates are not evil. <laughs> They're not the bad things. It's how you use it. You know how that, spray, that saying goes, you know, um, money is not evil, it's the love of money, right? It's what you do with it, right? Same thing, these pain medications have a purpose. And I'll tell you, they're very useful for someone who is status post, you know, traumatic spinal cord injury, had surgery, uh, is dealing with broken bones, and they have to do therapy. It's, it's magical. And I'll tell them, you know, I, I'm going to give you enough to... to Make your pain tolerable so you can participate in therapy. But here's my plan in two weeks, three weeks. You know, post-op pain lasts, what, two to three weeks. After that, if you're still in pain, I'm going to do an investigation. Why are you still having pain? Um, and I'll use the opiates for the pain management. But long be after that, you know, we need to reevaluate your opiate use, you know, because there's so many things that can go wrong with, you know, these days. Um, Here's some list of opiates. Um, there's a right way to use long acting and a right way to use short act, short acting. Um, like I said, it has a purpose, and um, there's a role for long and short acting. And I, I'm just naming some pain medications off to you, um, but I want to get to this slide because it describes. Things that can happen, bad things that can happen if you don't have a plan for your opiate use. Um, because you can develop any of these three. You don't plan on it happening to you, but it happens. Because it happens chemically, it happens at the level of you know neurons and your you know your brain. Tolerance. Essentially, tolerance is after a while, these medications don't have the same effect. And then you have to increase the dose. That's okay. But then if you don't have a plan for it, um, then your use will go up and go up and go up. And the efficacy will go down, go down, go down. Now, at some point, if you keep going up, you have to be careful that you're not treating something else other than pain here. Because you get into dependency. Dependency is when your body gets so used to it and at the molecular level, you have upregulation of receptors, um, and you have more need for the medications to have the same receptors bound to get the same effect. Essentially, your body gets so used to it that your body doesn't function well, your mind doesn't function well. Emotionally, you don't function well unless you get those opiates. That's dependency. And again, it's chemical dependency. Uh, there's a physical portion, there's chemical beyond your control. No one ever, you know, 
you know, um, plans. Oh yeah, I plan to be dependent on this. It just happens. So sometimes it's beyond your control. Uh, addiction. You know, the right way of, that addiction is defined is it's a behavior. So after you have tolerance, after you develop physical and chemical dependency, addiction is putting yourself in harm's way to obtain these medications. You know, stealing prescriptions. You know, break, you know breaking into pharmacies, um, buying off the streets. So essentially, it's a behavior where you put yourself in harm's way to obtain these medications because they, it's supporting a chemical dependency or physical dependency. Or you just want to get high. I don't know. So no one, you have to be careful about opiate use. And if you feel like you're somewhere here, you talk to your doctor. Say, you know what, I, I think I'm tolerant to it. I think I have some kind of dependence on it. Can you, you know... Help me here, you know, before I get I get to addiction. Um, I'm kind of jaded because the the pain population I dealt with in Boston, they were all addicted already. I mean, some of the stories I I, I can tell you, it's just amazing. Um, and once you're addicted, you know, you do crazy things. Um, question. Well, first of it, first off, it's it's education. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, those some patients that came into our inpatient pain program, I mean, they actually paid, you know, because insurances didn't cover it, so they paid money out of pocket because they're at, at the last straw. They realized that they're going down a black pit that they couldn't get out of, and the medications weren't the answer. So they would actually come in and we detox them. We teach them other means to deal with their pain. We educate them, educate them in terms of what's going on. And of course, we would do um, uh, investigation in terms of, you know, are they having uh, actual physical damage that's causing pain? Once we rule that out, then it's pretty much this memory that's going on, this tolerance, this physical chemical dependency. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, unless you have a progressively deteriorating um, um, situation that causes pain, you really have to evaluate, you know, why you're taking those opiates, you know, because it, there's, there's rare cases where you, you know, do have continued de degradation or injury to your, your body, like cancer or, you know, certain, you know, pancreatitis or, you know, certain things like that. But it's those, you know, it's really do you need constant opiates? Yeah. And actually, in the pain population, um, they shun away from long term opiates. Uh, and actually, chronic pain um, should not be treated with opiates. That's the, the, everyone agrees about that. Yes, yeah, so the question is does it uh, to get to take, you take too much and it doesn't help you anymore? Yeah. When you have you develop tolerance, um, and then at that time, if you you do have pain, you might you might legitimately need an increase in dose, but that should translate into you know um, better pain control and better function. But then you know only after a while should you have potent, uh, a situation where you're constantly damaging yourself and causing more pain. After that, you, you should evaluate and see. If you're having any potential tissue damage, or are you really just treating, you know, pain memory? Yeah, yeah. So remember that that's, that that um, that pain diary I told you. Um, so I, I like to draw it out in my head, or you know, I tell the residents to draw it out on paper. Um, so this patient has, oh, sorry, pain intensity. 6 a.m., they wake up with pain, uh, gets worse during physical therapy. Um, they take pain medication, it comes down, and then OT session, more pain, and right before bedtime, more pain. And you can see that they have a baseline of pain right here. So they're in four out of five pain all the time. These are just exacerbations here. All right? 
So these are the areas that we're targeting here. We want to low, you know, lower the peaks, and we want to fill in the valleys. So you fill in the valleys here because they have pain all the time. And I'm talking, I'm talking about legitimate pain here. You want to fill in this baseline pain with long-acting pain medication that gives them, you know, a, a, a amount of opiates all the time. You want to fill in these peaks with short-acting, uh, maybe. Uh, in this case, I would say, to, to fill it in, I would say, you know, before therapy, like an hour before, give them, you know, take a short-acting pain medication. That will, you know, lower the peaks, allow them to be more, uh, the pain to be more managed well before therapy so they can get more out of it. So pre-medication here, before OT, maybe a dose before bedtime. Because what, you're, what you want to achieve is this. You want to bring the baseline down. You want to decrease... The, the peaks, and I, to me, this is representative of good pain management. So there's, you know, there is uh, a pattern. There is actual um, way to use opiates most effectively, and it shouldn't be to just throw it your way and you know, um, and just hope that your pain goes down. <laughs> you have to be strategic. Because then, you know, you limit the chance for tolerance, chemical dependency, and addiction. And there's, these are other medications, mainly for nerve pain, anticonvulsants. You know, everyone knows gabapentin, right? I call it vitamin G because everyone gets it, you know. Uh, and legitimately, you know, a lot of patients should get it because you have nerve damage. Uh, it should always be reevaluated to see if you still need it. And you should try other things so that at one point you can get yourself off of gabapentin. Um, I won't get into this. Pregabapentin is a newer, you know, Neurontin. Um, Neurontin or gabapentin pre, or pregabalin, no one knows the mechanism of action. They're anti seizure medications, and by anti seizure medications, they kind of quiet down the nerves that might cause seizures. Um, so I think they do, they do the same thing for pain nerves to kind of quiet them down. Oh, there's tons of side effects. I mean, I know Dr. Shem does a, she did a study on how it affects your cognition. And pretty much the conclusion, it does affect your cognition. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of slows you down a little bit. Antidepressants, they're also a way to deal with pain because like I told you, you know, pain and um, emotions hand in hand here. So if you deal with the emotions, that'll help you deal with the pain. So don't be surprised if sometimes your doctor says, why don't we try an antidepressant? Why? I'm not depressed. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not nuts. You know, I just have pain. You know, but I'm telling you, your, interpret your interpretation of pain um, can be a little off, especially if your mood is off. You know, if your mood is up and down, so is your pain management up and down. If you stabilize that mood, you know, then maybe your ability to cope with the pain will be better. Right? I mean, Sometimes it's, you know, uh, you know, not useful, but a lot of times it is. You know, because, you know, one of the things that we, you know, term and use a lot is adjustment disorder. You know, when you first come into to one center and they, they say, oh, you're, you're just, you know, having problems adjusting to it. I mean, legitimately. I mean, you've gone through a serious accident or serious surgery or serious medical issue. You're adjusting to it. It's okay to, hit, get, to take this, you know, just to stabilize your mood. Just to help you, you know, tolerate, you know, the pain a little better. Um, you know, there's different types of, you know, mood stabilizers, you know, tricyclic antidepressants. I'll tell you, you know, I have a slide in here that uh, where they did a pretty exhaustive uh, review of all t different types of pain medications, and they assigned to them what we call a number uh, needed to treat, NNT number. So essentially, if the number is higher, like 10, that means that they have to give 10 people uh, this medication before one of them has benefits. So the lower number is the better, of course. And I'll tell you, it's an exhaustive, I don't know if I included it in here, but um, I'll tell you, you know, the numbers are so off that the conclusion is not all pain medications help all people. Certain ones help certain people. You have to just try it. Um, do a good trial and see what works for you. Um, 
Same thing with you know SSRIs, which are serotonin you know reuptake blockers or serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake blockers. Some of them are like Effexor or Cymbalta. I'm sure some guys know that. So these are all ways to manage your you know mood so that you can have better coping strategies. Uh, um, Cymbalta, duloxetine, bupropion. I, I included it for the residents. Um, so in summary, um, pain is very prevalent, and it can be a big barrier to rehabilitation and recovery. Uh, not only that, but it can be a big barrier to you living your life, because as you know, it can pain can last for a long time, especially if you don't have a handle on it, and you let you know your inability to cope with the pain just you know um, allow the pain to just fly off the handle. You know, be systematic in your evaluation and treatment. This is more for the healthcare providers. Um, have a, shaw, lo, a, a short and long-term treatment plan. Um, strive to be educated. I mean, I'm not telling you guys to, you know, demand education when your doctor doesn't want to give it. Because, you know, you know, be tactful and say, you know, hey, doc, you know, tell me what's going on. You know, hey, doc, you know, what, what's, what's your plan? You know, I, I really... I want to deal with this pain. I don't want to rely on medications. What are the other alternatives? You know, be inquisitive. You know, because if you know what's going on, it's less on your, your mind. It's, it's less on your heart, right? You're not worried about it. Um, so strive to be educated. You know, oh, get back a gabapentin. You're giving it to me, why? Um, what are the side effects? You know, what am I looking out for? What's a good trial? You know, um, and how long are you going to trial me on this before we make a decision? I mean, they should know answers to all this. Um, get some answers. Be tactful, you know, because it's a relationship. You know, if you're not tactful, I'll tell you, you know, physicians or nurse practitioners or nurses, they're just human. You know, if you're attacking them, you know, they're, you know, they're going to, you know, have their claws out too, you know. <laughs> Hopefully not, but, you know, be tactful because it's a relationship. And if that relationship is broken one way or another, if you're not patient, if they're not patient, then there's not good interplay here. You know. Here are my references. <laughs> and um, this is a good, good thing to end on. Um, this is a picture from Mexico. I took it. So, <laughs> so um, how much time do we have left? So we have five minutes for questions. Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, five minutes for questions. Um, yeah. So. Really interesting. Yeah. So, um, questions. If you could repeat the questions to work. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so the question is, uh, what the, how does FES help with pain? Well, it helps with pain because it keeps you active, it keeps your joints moving. Uh, it keeps your muscles, you know, from hypertrophying too much. Um, because I'll tell you, one of the biggest um, um, generators of pain is inactivity. The complications of inactivity. Because your muscles get hypertrophied, your joints ache, your tendons get weaker, your ligaments are weaker, you're prone to dislocations, you're prone to osteoporosis and fractures, um, and plus, you know, it's an activity. You know, it, you know, FES bike, you know, exoskeleton, you know, FES rowing, you know, you know, quad, you know, rugby, you know, everything, any activity, to get out there. Um, yeah. When you bring up the problem, why is it that we take care? Yeah, so the question is why is FES, um, you know, exercises or bike not available to certain um, uh, insurances? They are, they're, they're offered at some, but not all of them. Um, because they're uneducated, the insurance companies, they don't know what works. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I think it's their lack of education um, because we know 
from a clinical standpoint, it does help. Uh, I would have your doctors write a letter, you know, to try to get it approved. Um, are you talking about getting your own SDS bike or just? Yeah. Well, you know, I think if you, you get a referral um, PT or OT, um, they don't have to know that you're doing FPS bike. You know, um, that's including just exercises. Um, you know, I mean, the, when I write a prescription for patients, I'll say, you know, PT for range of motion, you know, exercises, FPS bike. Um, but, you know, I don't have to put it in if they're going to, you know, refuse to, to pay for it. But then I can write my notes to or talk to the therapist, say, you know, can you try to get this spike on him? You know, um, as, as a way to get around that. Um, it's just a way of exercise, you know, keeping your range. And your question on Neurontin? What exactly are patients now? I'm not even sure there's typically two uh, levels of patients. There's the patient. Well, you know what? Like I said, the mechanism action of gabapentin is not fully understood. We know that um, what it does, how it helps seizures, is it quiets through the sodium channels. It slows down the sodium channels so you don't get the nerve transmission as as fast as it usually goes. So since these seizures are just firing of these nerves, you know, automatically uh, in the brain that causes seizures. So at that nerve level, same thing for pain. It's I think it's these nerves are firing uh, unabated, uncontrolled, that's causing this, you know, nerve pain, this burning, tingling, pins needle. So what Neurontin does, as it does for, for seizures, it quiets down those nerves. It slows down the transmission. I think that's how it is. No one knows. I mean, there's no study that can connect it. But if you put, you know, indirectly, if you can try to connect, that's, I think that's how you connect it. Yeah. Question? I was just going to make a comment on FDS. That's what I use right afterwards with the FDS bike. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of those sessions, I'll give them a little bit of 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 a little bit yeah. What kind of insurance do you have? <laughs> yeah. I guess it is rock. But I do know I do know Medicare to do that. I don't know about Medicare, but I know Medicare to do that. Don't be too fast to write off acupuncture. I found it didn't work, and then I found a different acupuncture. Yeah. Yeah. I, so the, the 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 comment was don't be too fast to write off acupuncture, and I totally agree with you. I took six months of it to do it. <laughs> I don't do it anymore, but you know, yeah. We okay, have two more questions, and then we'll wrap up. I can't feel. Uh, I can't feel warm. I can't feel the cold. Yeah. Below my neck. Mhm. Mm shower. Sheets where the water is warm. Yeah. Uh, either a hot or cold in the extreme sort of show up as pain. Yeah. Same way as mm -hmm. uh, the pain in your neck, like hot days, you get sent. Yeah. Uh, it just sort of feels like a burning. Yeah. So again, without contact, I don't know whether it's cold or hot. Mm hmm. And I was sort of interested in the pathways and why that would yeah. be. Uh, well, the, the, the pain, the temperature, is tra travels to the C fibers, and that travels up your spinal cord. So if you have a spinal cord injury, it, that's going to be uh, impaired. Um, so you know those you know below your level, you might have an ability to sense you know temperatures. Now sometimes um, I have some people who some patients who do regain it, but I don't know how how far off are you from your injury. Right. I mean, how how many years have? Yeah, I think by that time, if you haven't had a return yet, uh, you're probably not going to get it. Um, Was that back to your first slide? Yeah. So the C fibers, um, um, they they transport the, the, the uh, hot and cold pain, the temperature types of pain, the extremes. 
Yeah, so that is damaged in because that goes up the spinal thalamic, uh, spinal thalamic. Yeah. The other fibers are pain. That's what I feel. Well, there's the A delta. Well, it might be damaged to both, depending on if it's a spinal, what side, what area of your spinal cord is injury, injured. The spinal thalamic is pretty much right in the middle, so you know that's usually a little bit on the side, but the spinal thalamic is a little bit on the side, um, but in the the middle part of it. So usually that is impaired unless somehow you it's spared. But most most spinal injury patients do have problems with you know, sensing, heat, you know, cold and hot temperature pain. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.